Hello again, everyone. Dr. Noir here. Uh, just to say, as our festival, online festival, has been going on, um, you may notice uh, that authors um, get rather excited uh, about aspects of their work, um, about being in lockdown, and sometimes um, maybe some little swear words pop out there. Um, I think it, it actually reflects the fact that, you know, we are very relaxed um, in our conversations and possibly the lack of a live audience as well. Um, I know no offence uh, has been intended and I hope none's taken. I hope it's not spoiled in any way uh, your enjoyment of, of our time together at NN 2020 uh, Online Festival. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to the last panel for the second part of what's been Newcastle Noir 2020 online festival. Um, lockdown life has brought a lot of challenges, I know, uh, for all of us. And I do hope that you are staying safe and well out there. Um, but you know, lockdown life can also bring around the sweetest of surprises. Um, and this panel is one of those uh, because my two guests here this evening, uh, we didn't plan this panel. It came out by happy accident or serendipity. Uh, and I am just thrilled. Uh, two of my favourite uh, writers um, coming from the continent. We've called this panel Continental Murder. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, you all know that Dr. Noir feels extremely European at heart, regardless of what may or may not be happening out there. So please, if you will, settle back. Um, hope you have a, a drink there, uh, some snacks, because we're going to go on a little wander through what, to my mind, is an amazing body of work uh, brought to us, I should say, in translation, uh, thanks to, to the amazing team at Arenda Books. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about Arenda as well uh, in our conversation. Um, but Johanna Gustafsson, welcome. Uh, and, okay. and Simona Buchholz, welcome to, the, to this evening's conversation around mm. your work. And as we've said in our little planning meeting, and maybe because of the situation, let's talk about some aspects of contemporary feminism, what's happening there in the world for women in lockdown. Yeah. And so post to that, cheers. <laughs> cheers, lady. Cheers. So, uh, Johanna, you, you originally write in French, but we have your work uh, in English. And Simone, you originally write in German. And what I've been doing with authors is going a little bit back to the beginning. And I see that both of you studied at university. Uh, Simone, you did philosophy and literature. And Johanna, you, you went down the political science route. And I wonder when you were those awesome students back in the day, did it ever cross your mind that you would be well-known crime fiction writers? <laughs> no, never, <laughs> never. Never, and, and, and you know what? I wanted to be a TV presenter. <laughs> <laughs> Johanna. I swear Ooh. I wanted to host political, uh, you know, debates. Mm -hmm. That was my thing, you know? I wanted to host and to, because I thought that he, he would, I, I didn't think that I would, um, that I would have the temper to be able to be a politician. I think I'm way too passionate. So I thought to be in between politicians like that, that would be perfect. I would get my dose, you know, and I would send them back what's not working. And then I don't know what happened there. <laughs> in the middle of that road, you know, suddenly, I don't know, you know, I studied law before, before political science. Okay. And because I thought I needed to have a solid background. And then I don't know, I started working on TV and I got bored as hell. <laughs> Because content is boring, I realize mm. that, that you're more puppeteer than anything else, you know, you, you have to do a certain content. And, and I started working for press and I realized that it was a lot of fun 
um, but it was the same thing. You have a pressure of content. You cannot really, um, you cannot really go after a story. You have to follow the editorial route that is given to you. You know, mm -hmm. so all freedom was lost, and uh, you know, it, it just started by I became an actress at the same time, and I thought that the freedom is not as good. And then I started writing, and then I thought that's it. I can create my world. It's happy there. You can kill the people I hate, you know, or the one I like. Uh -huh. So there was there was that freedom that was searched for initially. Oh and yes. it, yeah, and it, and it was found in the creation. Yeah. So I, I like that. Thank you. I'm going to come back and ask you more than, of course, about that creation. But but Simona, for you, studying philosophy uh, and literature. Uh, and and you did go on to become a journalist, did you not? Yes, uh, first of all, I, I'd love to see Johanna as a um, presenter in a politician's talk show, really. I'd, can I do your, your hair then or something? <laughs> really, I, I'd love to, I'd love to be in your team. Um, we would just burn everything down. It would be beautiful. Um, I think it would be like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Crashing. <laughs> um, yes, you know, when, when you're studying philosophy and literature, um, you don't think that you're going to end up somewhere successful. <laughs> mm. So I was, yeah, I was always, I was always a bartender when I was studying and I thought maybe that I would end there serving drinks to people um what happened that um this combination of um serving people drinks mm -hmm. and studying literature and philosophy was a really nice mixture to get to know a lot about people and about human beings and you learn to observe in the bar when you're serving people and when they get drunk and drunk and more drunk and more drunk. And then you're studying philosophy. You're learning a lot about all the different perspectives you can, you can have on life. Um, also then in the literature. Um, so there went something together maybe. And um, um, then I kind of realized that there is one other thing I'm okay in, which was writing, and I had to earn some more money. So, um, so I started to to yeah to um, to work for uh, not really newspapers, but always magazines like women's mm -hmm. magazines, football magazines, economy magazines, youth magazines, and I did that for 15 years. And then I was just um, fed up with the content production mm -hmm. because you you know you write about the same things repeat in a year, repeat again. So um, I also felt like I need some more freedom in my way of telling the world and telling the stories. And um, so I accidentally ended up writing crime literature. Indeed. Mm. Mm. Well, so, so the accident of getting to crime fiction. We're at that moment that I want then to look at that journey when you got into crime fiction. And when, for yourselves, other people might have been saying, yes, you are. But when on this journey, for yourself, in your heart or in your head, did you get that sense of, yeah, I've made it. I can call myself, you know, whether in French, you know, I, I write polar or, or in German, you know, I write creamy. When did you feel, and maybe you don't yet, I don't know, but has there been a moment where you thought, yes, I've made it? Yes, definitely. When I felt for myself that um, I'm not only doing this by accident, but um, I'm doing this because I want to write about violence and there is a need to write about it, to show my readers, how it comes into the world and what it does to people. And I think that was kind of in the, maybe in the in book number four in the first series, which is only out in Germany, um, when I had the feeling, okay, I'm doing, I'm doing something serious here. 
um, it's not only about entertainment. It's about it's about my way of storytelling and um, about yeah bringing people into a situation in their mind where they kind of live through these escalated situations with violence and 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 try to look at it and try to sometimes feel it what happens when this shit happens so. yeah. Yeah. And, and i think it's a it's a safe place in a way from which to consider points of view mm. different points of view violence I, I i think the fictional side of it however much writing may be based on factual things um, i think fiction allows us a safe moment to consider maybe not so safe mm. things and i want to come back and talk about that because i know you both again in these six novels whilst you know crime fiction but there's some heavy topics in here that that you venture into um, and i'm, I'm going to pull a lot out of that but I just want to ask you, Hannah, because you seemed a little bit reticent when we were talking about I've made it. Um, why? I, I, um, I'm still looking at that with... Um, um, I, I, I don't really realise it. You know, for me, it's just been three books. I'm preparing my fourth. Um, something big happens during the lockdown is that I've been... Um, how do you say hunted by one of France's big publishers. I mean, Simone knows because we're talking about that when we were on the road, but now I'm the outside, so I'm going to be published by Calman Levy. So it's, it's wonderful, but I'm still looking at it thinking, is that real? I mean, is it, and, and then of course, I mean, I'm making money out of this. This is my job. Mm. I mean, so it's, I always get, because I know that I have people coming to me and asking me, for example, that is something you do a lot in France, can you read my manuscript? And I'm always, I don't think that I am le legitimate to do that, you know? I still mm -hmm. have that thing where I look at my book and I don't really realize it. So it's, I'm still in the realization process. So I, I don't have the feeling I've made it. I, um, yes, I, I don't really realize it. It's, it's, it's the funny aspect of it, but I'm enjoying it immensely though. I, for me, it's more than, in a way, is more than making it because I'm going beyond what I've ever dreamed of. Mm. Dreamt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and you know, because, you know, looking at, at, at the, the bio, you know, what you've, you know, the, the awards that you've received, you know, to me, there are many an author who hasn't received the accolades that you've received that would consider themselves a successful author. And, you know, I, I just wish you all all the very best, especially having, you know, that, that, that new contract in France. Oh, I think that, yeah. That, very excited. Here, excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, can, I can well imagine. So... Let's let's get into the the juicy uh, part of 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 your your writing, um, I, and I want to start with looking at what people might have said about your work. So, Simona, for example, it's been said that you, you know the the books that we're reading. I'm not sure about the the ones that aren't yet translated, but the ones that we can read here in the UK that they are classic. American noir with the sense of Chandler or Hammett uh, rather than you being influenced or, or, or there being any sense there of you know traditional German crime fiction do you think that's a fair comment on on your writing <laughs> um, it's a it's a massive comment and I really like it <laughs> thank you but I think there there is uh, influence from German writers. There's Jakob Ajuni, who's also mm -hmm. translated to, to English, um, who influenced or who had a lot of influence on me um, because I, I love to read that when I was in my 20s. And um, the American hardboiled writers, yes, they are there um, in case of the 
of the hard boiled sound I think mm -hmm. I'm trying to produce and um, the bit broke down world or broken down world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, when it comes to the character, the, the, the main character, um, Chastity Riley, there's also a lot of um, Dorothy Parker in it, I think. The, the drinking woman, um, the woman who doesn't fit in mm -hmm. and um, who just refuses to, um, to play the decent role. Um, so yes, there is an American influence, but it's not only, it's not only the boys. Mm, yeah. <laughs> like I, uh, I love what you say. And, and, and I really appreciate that, that notion of the rhythm, you know, how it sounds as it goes, it, it's got that rhythm. Whereas I think, you know, if we think about your work, Johanna, your work seems i don't know there's 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 a lyrical side to it um and even though you take us between uh different time frames you know because that is a, definitely a hallmark of your work you know you you weave us in and out so we're not quite sure where, but but that that's exciting D do you do you acknowledge that do you do you write understanding that there is a poetic flow to what you do? Yes, actually, I, 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 I really enjoy that part of working on the language. I've, um, when I, and that's for me, it's, it's a wonderful compliment that you pay me and that, that and but to me, but to the translator and the for, I mean, for Maxim Jakubowski and, uh, and, um, and David Warner, because he, uh, who are my translators into English, I, I've always been very fond of poems. I mean, I've read, I've been reading that since I knew how to read. And it's true that when there is a lot of sea in my book, the sea is very present. And I know that when in French, because I write in French, I, I, I'm talking about the sea. If there is a movement of the sea, I like the same rhythm and the same sound to go on with, with the sound of the words. So I know that I, I, plan, I imagine, I can imagine how we must be to translate that. But it's, it's true that there is, um, that I, I try, that I have fun actually doing this, uh, putting some, some poetic notes and, uh, and really having fun with words. I can spend time on a couple of sentences. It's really the, the last part after plotting, because I plot, I really enjoy that. And um, and uh, French is a beautiful language to to work with. I really en I really enjoy it. I really enjoy that. Yeah, I'm always envious. Sorry, come in, Simona. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think um, every writer comes either over the beat or the melody when it comes to language. And I think you maybe I think it's not a conscious decision, but um, if you read a book, oh. you will feel it very quickly are we talking about melody are we talking about beat of course everything has beat and a melody but there's a kind of weight and when this comes together you get the rhythm so this is kind of i think it's a, it's a good for me it's always a good trick to learn something about a writer when i look at the way he he's knitting his yeah. stuff you know, mm -hmm. is it more beat? Is it more melody? Mm -hmm. How's the rhythm made? How's the song made? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's, yeah, and that's totally right. Your melody. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, even though, and, and, and all credit, you know, as you're saying, to, to the people who have translated you. So Maxim and David have, mm -hmm. have translated you. And is it, is it Rachel Ward? It's Rachel Ward. That Rachel. Oh, it's fantastic. She's really, because, you know, she has to get the beat, which is also very very difficult in a different language i think exactly and i and i really you know i really appreciate the fact that i can i can hear you and feel you both in the writing the people that you are the authors that you are is not lost you know that, that this is so nice Jackie. thank oh, you oh, <laughs> yeah honestly it's honestly, honestly and and i think you know when readers take a book and and you know we go on a journey and we have an adventure but it's 
it's the author that is our guide really along that journey you know and so say you know say we went a walk in in london or in hamburg and you're pointing out to me places and explaining to me things that might have happened there or what they mean to you it's your it's your voice it's it's your perspective that you bring to my real journey and i think as authors you do that for us as readers you bring a perspective that i don't think you can help but hide yourself you know because I, i'm coming back to what you what you were saying before simona about those issues that matter to you you know that you want to talk about and i know it's the same for you you know johanna there are issues there that you want to bring out so to get that voice it's beautiful before we talk about those issues though let's go back to your characters um and johanna you you give us sort of like a, a duo but i think they're a bit of an unlikely duo I, I don't think you would expect to find two people like that easily put together so for people who've not read your work give us a little introduction to your two characters i know there are others but those main ones yes um they so my two characters are Roy and Castel. So Emily Roy is a profiler. She's Canadian. Um, she is um, uh, she's, uh, not an easy person to be around because she's a very fine psychologist. She's working for uh, Scotland Yard. But at the same time, she likes studying people, but I don't think that she likes people. She gets annoyed by them. So she likes her own company. Um, so she's not easy to be around, but I think she's very honest. She doesn't get bothered by people. Um, and uh, and on, on the other side, so, so we have that profiler who um, doesn't really have a professional, uh, um, sorry, a personal life. She is, I mean, I, 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 I read the, 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 the life of, um, of um, uh, a lady uh, was a um, profiler in the 90s in South Africa, who is called Miki Pistorius, who was actually the aunt or mm -hmm. uh, aunt of, um, of uh, Oscar Pistorius. For the, 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 mm -hmm. And she was, she's but the most prof famous profiler over there. And she, she, she looks like um, a literature teacher, you know, I mm -hmm. mean, very petite and she talks like that and you feel that she's going to tell you you know about Moliere or about Shakespeare mm -hmm. but actually she's telling you you know about intestines and and serial killers and so I just found that when I saw her face because I, I was lucky enough to get a, a video or shooting of um of an interview from her and I was looking at her thinking what's coming out from her mouth and how she looks like I mean the the how do you say the difference between the two is just amazing that that just by itself it's so interesting feels like there is a movie there and so that is one of my character and the other one she is a um she's a french lady a southerner who is living in london because she is um she is a true crime writer and she specialized in in uh, serial killers she has written quite a lot of books being successful and uh she is i would say the the warm and more real aspect of this duo and um, I don't think that they they could not socialize really but they work well together that's what being a team is about mm -hmm. and um, yes I think each one of them are part of, of the woman I would have loved to be you know in a way it's my fantasy a little <laughs> bit here and there <laughs> You know. I, I like as well the fact that they, as you say, they're, you know, they're not the best of friends. It's not, oh. you know, it, it's not that close, but they are close in their dealings of yeah. looking at the issues. Which, I which think I they work well together. It's almost like sometimes the couple, you know, couples work for certain things, but not for others, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's a... There is a metaphor in there. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am sure there are, I'm sure. Um, but we won't go there, probably. Um, <laughs> maybe later. Anyway, um, but but so then, Simone, you uh, you have Chastity Riley, um, and she is part American. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Part yeah. American, part German. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
So an interesting fusion uh, of insider outsider, maybe. I, I, I... Yes, she she's a bit. <sighs> yeah, she's she's part of the system and part of the country or society she lives in. And um, on the other hand, she's always a stranger and can't really relate to um, the way people are living in the system. And um, she also can't really relate to her own feelings and what's going on inside, um, which makes her um, difficult. <laughs> Sometimes I, I, I really didn't like her in the beginning, I have to say. Uh -huh. I, she was like totally strange to me and I, I felt like, oh my God, what did you what did you send me from 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 heaven there i i can't i can't deal with this um lady and um but over the years you know we 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 got to know each other a bit better and um um yeah maybe i i like the way she looks at the world mm -hmm. this kind of within the system but also being able to step outside yeah. and um th that that produces maybe um kind of strange pictures in the books but also a lot of humor i think yeah um yeah. so i yeah I, I i like meeting her i like being with her now i didn't i didn't do oh, now yeah oh. th there's been a a development or maybe the oh sorry are you back Sorry. with us? Yes, I'm back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so over the years, uh, do you, I mean, do you feel, you know, do you feel more disposed towards her? Do you like her more than, or is it, do you feel you understand her better? It's more about understanding, I think. Um, it's about, you know, when it, in the early books, I, I was like, maybe I would go for a beer with her, but I'm not sure if I would go with her alone or maybe invite some other friends mm -hmm. to not be so close to her. Um, but today I would say she could move in here. Would be okay. That would be not okay. always easy, but yeah, we have a, I think we have a big understanding for each other. She also has understanding for me. She, yeah. she's okay with him where I'm sending her, I think. Yeah. I like, I love that. Can I, can I use that idea to come back to Johanna and say, would you, I mean, again, when you set off with Roy and, and, and Castles, do you, do you feel differently about them now? And would you have them round to stay with you? Yeah, I think I, I adopted them very quickly. I don't know how to put it, but I, I mean, there is a, a little story that is, that is, that says a lot about the place that they can take. Uh, I just finished writing Block 46 and I, had, I was celebrating my, my first son's first birthday. And uh, the day before, so it was a big party, you know, at home um, in, in our bed with my husband. I was like, okay, I think I messed up. I think I forgot to, to invite someone. There is someone I forgot to invite. I forgot to invite someone. I cannot, I was looking at the list, you know, and Matthias was with me. Um, and suddenly I was like, it's Emily. And I was like, fuck, she's not real. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really, you know, that second when my character, it gives me goosebumps just to think about it. When I was like, you're not, she's not real. She cannot come to your party. You know, mm -hmm. it was crazy. And, and that for me, and I know that because there has been a lot of um, space between my books because I did beat babies in between. <laughs> but so the time that it was taking for me to write again, I missed them so much, but I missed more Emily, despite the fact that I wouldn't go to have a drink with her. I think she wouldn't talk to me. I think I would annoy her, to be honest, you mm -hmm. know? I think I would be way too chatty, way too friendly, you know. I think she would like, just get, get out of my side. She wouldn't talk, she would just leave, you know. So I don't think we would get along well. Um, but, 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 but yeah, I, I, I admire her. I think mm. she's so different from me. She couldn't be more different. Mm. I, I, I love the woman she is. This is where the fantasy is, you know. I'm not children 
crunch. She runs, you know, at 5 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> she eats green tea. She doesn't eat certain meat, you know. She's the opposite of me. I love that woman. <laughs> I, I, I adore the way that you're both talking about these creations that, that, that you know, that are yours. Um, but if we might turn to, to darker aspects now, um, the, the things that, that you've, you've written about. Um, and Simone, if we start with, with, with Blue Knight um, and a uh, number of aspects of it, but the idea of the world of synthetic drugs and Hal Hamburg's Albanian mafia. And, and I just wondered to be able to research, I'm thinking especially the mafia, did you at any point feel that you put yourself in, in any danger? No. No, 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 really, no, never, because, um, you know, I'm, my husband is from southern Italy, so... Um, <laughs> just try, guys, just try. Um, no, I think, you know, honestly, I, um, I did a lot of research with the police, um, and talked to a lot of lot of people who know a lot about this um, Albanian mafia structure we had for a long time in Hamburg. Um, but they were here from the early 90s on, I think. And um, you can read everything in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. You just um, have to put it together and whoop, mix it or look at it in one piece. And um, so I wrote nothing investigative, you know, nothing new. Mm -hmm. um, no, I was no, 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 I never. My husband sometimes says, please remind that we are having a name on the door. <laughs> so, but you know, I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm not scared to stand in front of anyone, mm -hmm. you know? No, why? Mm, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, I, you know, I just think when, when you begin, when one begins to not just scratch a surface, but to actually, you know, reveal. Um, and again, as I was saying before, get us to consider these things. And, you know, should you go so far as to maybe tread on somebody's toes figuratively mm. or reveal something that um, might be a little bit in, you know, indiscreet maybe. And, and Yes, but I'm not Roberto Saviano, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, so I, I, I don't reveal anything. I just tell stories about things you can read in the newspapers and you can read out of these stories. You just have to read a bit more concentrated, maybe. Yeah. So um, I think they don't care about me no. mm -hmm. uh, because I'm a woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm interesting. <laughs> I was about to say just that, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That. Yeah, they, they just don't, they're, they're not scared. Because I, yeah, what can she do? Yeah, 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 this, this is no threat. This is just a woman writing a story. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. Good for me. Good for me. Good for me. <laughs> yeah. How how foolish? Because I do believe there's 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 a considerable amount of power uh, in this kind of writing. But but that's just my crazy point of view. Um, Johanna, your first novel you mentioned it, Block Forty Six, and 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 in that um, we see already that that trait that you have. You have us in Hampstead Heath. And then you have us in Sweden, and then you take us back in time uh, to, to 1944 as well, and and to you know that that very difficult space uh, of the Buchenwald concentration camp. I'm intrigued to know why it is for you it's so important to blend time and space. Mm. Um, I, I will start because it's easier. The space part is. Um, I think that I, I built my my books, uh, this traveling aspect in Europe, very much to the woman I, I was and I still am when I, when I started writing the series. So it was 
um, a French, a southerner French, married to a Swede and living in London. And I always looked at my um, husband family with a smile because there's so many things culturally which are so different. I mean, our, our family, our family's get gatherings are, I mean, to die out of laughter with when it used to be my grandparents talking like that and my, 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 uh, um, my husband's gran granny was thinking that we were fighting, but we're just talking, you know? <laughs> so I thought that was so interesting, you know? And I wanted to talk about this West Coast of Sweden because um, not many French people had done that. And I thought it would, it would be fascinating to do so. So that was the first part. And then for the history, I think I'm, um, I've always been, that's what I did when I was studying political science, being fascinated about human behavior as a group, which means that what led a society to do certain things. So it was, for example, um, um, for example, the, the, the Catalan language. Why do they come to be um, all those um, 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 regions in Spain, for example, so jealous about their languages? What happened to them? Well, there is a reason. There was a French king who fucked it up all in the 16th century. So there is always an answer. And what I think is at the scale of the family of human beings, I really believe in psychogenealogy, which means that the way that I will be acting today as a woman, the fact that I'm writing may be crime. The answer to that may be with my grandparents or certain things did. And I think it's some action that we, 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 we do are really written in the pattern of our families. So I've always been interested in looking to the why, we, which can be a few generations back. And of course, I come from a family of psychologists. So as a kid, you know, I was falling and my mother was saying, oh, you hurt yourself? I said, yeah, yeah, but which knee did you fall on? Left one, why? Because it's very important. You know, left's gonna be the you do towards us, you know? So I was brought up with that kind of thing. So for me, asking why is always something. My son's mm. gonna have a sore throat. I'm gonna start talking to him to see why he has a sore throat. If something didn't go through, you know? <laughs> so, we, it's, so I think with my book, I did the same. And with serial killers, what is absolutely fascinating, I think, is the fact that why, because why were they the one who just completely slipped, you know? Because how many times you think, oh, fuck, I would like to kill him or to kill her. I would like to smash her face. I mean, oh, I speak for me. I mean, this is <laughs> you know? Sorry, British people, not the same, but you know, <laughs> thousand of like, God, you know, we, we would come with the, you know, French, we do revolutions and we, but, but you know, <laughs> you don't do it. But serial killers, they do. So what happened to them? They're not, they're not, um, they're not, um, um, I mean, what, what happened to them? What happened to the fact that they, they slip through the system, that they, they happen to take that action? I find that fascinating. And very often the question, uh, the, the answer is uh, in the childhood. Mm. Now it's very, very wonderful that you say that because, because you take us neatly uh, to Beton Rouge uh, to Simona's yep. second book. Yeah. <laughs> hey, <Joe. laughs> Teamwork, I love it. Um, but where we have newspaper executives, two of them, who have been caged and tortured uh, and left outside their offices. Um, this is a revenge tale. Uh, is it not? And the notion of what might have happened to people uh, as as younger people. Um, so would you say as well, Simona, that, that for you there's a notion of what happens in the past has repercussions in the present? Um, I'm not really good in psychology, I think. <laughs> Johanna will help. She's good. Sorry. Yes, which is good because, uh, yeah, that's why we are in a team together. Yeah. Um, no, I think that um, I, I, my, sto my stories and my storytelling is always about structure. Mm -hmm. I look at structures and I try to 
to um, to reveal what structures are doing to the life of people. And um, in Beton Rouge, I would say it's about what um, institutions, that the institutions of today mm -hmm. are producing the monsters of tomorrow. So if something's going wrong in an institution like a boarding school um, or a church or wherever, these structures are producing people who are kind of so damaged um, that they have no other chance to, to act like a bit non-human. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I would never blame people. No, I would, I would always, because people are to me so vulnerable. Um, we're just, we're just human beings and we make mistakes. Um, mm -hmm. But I think if you, if, um, if the structure we're living in is producing violence, or is structured violently, then things are coming out not so good. Mm. So, yeah, hold on to that because I did want to ask you as well about the the second book. Um, the Chastity gets a new colleague, Stefanovic, uh, who I wanted to ask you is is he another outsider? Um. Yeah, more he doesn't he doesn't really feel like an outsider. I think um, he's 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 very self confident. Um, he has only one problem that he can't stay at his home at night. He can't stay at home when it's dark. Um, but this is a story who which will be revealed in the next book after Mexico Street, which is out now. So. Um, why this happened to him it's just a, one a, a big a big gap in his heart mm -hmm. so um no i think he he feels quite confident with um with himself and uh, or his self mm -hmm. um but um he also doesn't really fit in you know he grew up in the in the station part of frankfurt where it's a bit rough and um not very clean and um but he just he doesn't care i would say um chastity sometimes does care that mm -hmm. she doesn't fit in she, she she feels it and she she realizes it and notices and things like mm -hmm, and starts to feel uncomfortable and leaves the situation and he's he's the opposite um he's just like what's wrong am i annoying you what what he's constantly talking and um <laughs> annoying her so but there is a link between the two. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think um, they would have been friends in school, definitely. And you take them to the south, yeah? The, mm. the, the investigation takes them to the south. And, and I wondered, you know, because Hamburg plays such, you know, a key role, you know, that, that setting is, you know, again, is, is such a strand that runs through your writing. What made you take a decision to move them out of that space? Um, the south of Germany is sometimes a bit more restrictive, um, which we also learn again at the moment um, with the different parts of Germany and how the shutdown is, um, is, 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 yeah, is lifted and not lifted. And um, the north is always a bit more laid back and yeah, come on, it's the harbor and seagulls and water and wind. So everything will be fine. And in the, in the South, the South is just more Catholic. So it's more restricted. The whole, the whole society is a bit more under pressure, I think. Mm -hmm. And so that was a good place for me to, to, to um, create a boarding school. I think up in the North that wouldn't have worked like yeah, yeah. Um, with um, children just to, to shut up and 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 um, and not move, um, I think in the eighties in southern Germany, where I grew up near Frankfurt, um, there were certain parts, villages, where you just had to shut up and mm -hmm. function. Mm -hmm. So a, a very interesting contrast then in in those two spaces. Um, this feels like a little bit of a whistle top stop tour through through your through your, your books, but I hope it's okay the way that that we're doing it. Um, because I'm gonna go then to Johanna to your second book, which is Keeper. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, and I think, if you don't mind me saying this, I think it was a really, it was a brave choice to make because I think maybe writing it, because you wrote it in French first, yeah? Yes, yes. But then for it to be translated into English, um, we read your book last year in, in my book club at the, the library in Newcastle. And people were saying, oh, for her to choose to have that, that aspect of Jack the Ripper's London mm -hmm. in there, which, you know, for, for most British readers, there's, there's a place in our psyche of that story, you know, that time and, and all that that, that meant. Mm -hmm. When you did your research for that, because again, somebody, somebody said of the work, and it's so true, mm -hmm. that Gustafsson captures Victorian London with all its seediness, stench and crime as graphically as Dickens did its poverty and despair. And I think it, I think that is just a beautiful, you know, sums up, you know, that aspect of your work. Was it, was it grim to do your research in that? It was basic. I, I you know, I never thought I, actually, I really thought I would never write about the Reaper. Mm -hmm. Because I thought, as a French, who am I to write about the Reaper? But what happened was that I believe in things which are put on your path. And I believe it even more if there are women who are put on my path and destinies. And what happened was that I came across um, one of uh, Jack the Reaper's victim, who was called um, um, uh, Grand Lise, was actually called um, Gustav's daughter. She was Swedish. So she was Swedish and she was coming from a town very close to Falkenberg where I have all my characters. So when I read that about the victims, I thought, hang on. I, it gives me goosebumps again, just I think I cannot not talk about the victim. I don't give a damn about the Reaper. I'm mm -hmm. gonna talk about those women that everyone were picturing as prostitutes. There were not prostitutes. There were mothers who didn't have a dime, and that was the thing. And they mm -hmm. were uh, cleaning or um, doing, we call that passes in French, when you do that kind of thing in prostitution just to be able to afford a bed at night, mm -hmm. which is very different. And if I'm gonna talk about those women, I'm gonna give them a voice, I'm gonna make them exist. And for me, that was a calling, you know? So that's how I went. And then it was very interesting because what you know about London as, as a foreigner, I mean, what you know about London about that period, you know the Victorian London, the flamboyant London. You know, you, you, of course, you know about the East End, and, but you don't know to that extent to the poverty that I read about because I was reading the newspaper at that time to get really the timing and to see what the journalists were saying about each victim. And the, the, the smell, I remember when I was reading, I always had that smell in my, in my nose, you know, that smell of the, 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 which must have been even worse, but of the garbage, which kept old fish and that kind of thing, you know, that you really feel the stench that's sticking at you, you know, and, uh, and that's what I wanted people, I wanted people to smell to smell that, to stay with that smell. For me, it was, it was um, more than anything at, the, at, that, um, at that time. And, and, I, and I felt for those women. I really, for me, it was, um, I, I felt bad about the fact that I thought they were prostitutes. I said, mm. you should know better. You studied quite a bit. I mean, I knew about Jack the Reaper, but I just was interested in him, not in them, those women. You know, so that was a fascinating aspect to get to know them and give yeah. them a voice, you know, a real one. Yeah, I love that. The idea of giving people a voice who may have been silenced or may have never had a chance to, to speak their truth, to tell how their life has been or is. Uh, and, and I know for a fact that you bring in that aspect out I you know I know like I say even just from a small reading group I, people people were challenged by their understanding mm. of, of something that they felt very sure about mm. and I, yeah I like that okay Simona um Mexico Street the latest that we have um 
you want to tell us a little bit about Mexico Street, um, what it's about and why you wanted to bring out again, maybe that aspect of society? Oh my God, is, is this the elevator pitch now? <laughs> yeah, it is, it is and, you know, and you know Karen will be very pleased if you do this, so come on. I am not prepared to do the elevator pitch. Okay, um, <laughs> um, I can't. It's too late. You know, we're one hour ahead in Germany. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. homeschooling and everything. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Karen, I can't do the elevator pitch. It's, uh, it's all about structure again. It's about a smaller, closed system, about families, about family clans. Um, it's a kind of a mafia story. Um, but it's mostly about um, two people, um, Nuri and Alisa, they get to know each other when they're really, really small, when they're children, and they fall in love over the years. And um, they are both children from one of these, or two of these clan families. And it's a bit of Romeo and Juliet mm. stories. They are, they are torn apart and try to find each other. And of course, it doesn't end very, doesn't end very happily. Um, and um, Chastity and Stepanovich are playing Romeo and Juliet too, I would say, mm. a bit. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's kind of, um, he realizes that she is more than a colleague and she realizes that he realizes and she just pretends to not notice. Mm. I would say yeah. because she hates she hates this coming close thing she would be very very good in the social distancing I think <laughs> yeah especially for unwanted well are they unwanted uh, feelings or is she is she happy to entertain the fact that somebody is drawn towards her so long as she doesn't have to reciprocate uh, she's just uh, she she it's just strange for her. You know, she was, she was two years old when her mom left her. And when she was 20, her father killed himself and not in a very silent way, you know, he just shot a bullet in his head. So um, she's taught, totally traumatized with, with um, um, trusting someone. And um, um, she, she thinks emotions are dangerous. And she's scared of it. And for her, it's a strange thing people are doing. So wh why they are doing this, love? Mm. So, but of course, she has all these feelings too. She just, um, she just thinks it's strange. It's weird. Mm -hmm. And yet, and yet, with these elements of, you know, there's two strands of love going on there, and and problematic love at that. But looking at um, this criminal gang activity, um, and is it not a certain ethnic background that these gangs are from? That, yeah, that, that's yeah. that's the problem. That was the problem, not with the research, because you can you can talk to people at the um, talk to detectives who who work on exactly these families for already thirty years, and they know every about everything about them. Um, but that was the problem in writing of course for me because you can't you can't blame people to be who they are but there is a certain history um in these families um like 800 years ago um they always suffered under not being part of a society first in turkey then in lebanon then in germany they're just not accepted they 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 are, they are not allowed to take part into society and um in for different reasons uh, but in germany the only reason is that we we still pretend to not be an immigrant immigrant country which is bullshit we are an immigrant country so um but the structure again is is not is not paying off for that, so um, I, I think they are not to blame for mm. the way they are living and for the criminal structure they established. It was just some kind of um, they needed a way to earn money and yeah. a society to stay in. And but 
it ended up in a very, very closed society, which is very, very cruel and very archaic. And um, especially the girls and the women are not seen as human beings, um, but as um, birth machines. So they're getting up to 12 children. Um, and um, they're just there to reproduce mm -hmm. the system. And um, I wanted to show what, what happens to people who want to get out of this. Yeah. It's yeah. two young people. And um, Alisa, she's very rebellious. Um, she wants to start a revolution every day, every morning when she wakes up. And Nuri, he's more like, he's a bit more shy and um, wants to kind of slip out of the system. But of course, for both, it's not not it's not anywhere well because if you if you if you are kept in, in or or born into a system like this you just have no chance mm -hmm. indeed thank you for that your elevator pitch was beautiful by the way it was a bit long i think huh? was it was oh, it like going uh, up to the 200th floor i'm sorry it's great no it's so good and again the beautiful segue will put it back to Johanna and yeah. because, because Simona mentioned about um, baby machines um, and it takes us beautifully does it not to a certain aspect of, of blood song um, where the whole notion of corruption in the fertility industry is the present day aspect uh, that we might be looking at um, as well as you always manage to throw in some very unpleasant murders as well. <laughs> yeah, there. But I know for me, um, I love that aspect, but for me, you know, the, the really intriguing part of, of this story is the aspect about Spain. Do you want to tell us about this book and why that Spanish aspect of the story you wanted to bring out? I think this this is a book I wanted to, to to write for a long time, and I just needed time because it's a it's a book that is very dear to me because the two sides of my family, my two grandfathers, had a, have a, had a link to the civil war. So my maternal grandfather was bo born in Barcelona, and he had to um, to leave Barcelona because of the civil war in, in um, between thirty six and thirty nine. And my older grandfather, my paternal one, was much older. He was 12 years older. Um, him, um, he was a wood carver, um, but he was a believer. He, he was a humanist. And he was a communist. And he decided to go to fight with the Republicans against the dictator Franco. Um, so my heart, of course, is French, but my roots are Spanish. They're Catalan and they're Valencian, and I have my family still in a very small village called El Palomar when they're just 1,000, and we, I grew up with them, you know, there. And I wanted to, to, to talk about those years in Spain because we know the civil wars, which were three years, but Franco stayed until the mid-70s, mm. ruling uh, with terror, uh, killing people, hundreds of thousands of people. And then all, all countries were dealing with him economically, uh, industrially. I mean, he was, and when he died, he just gave over his power to the king. And then both left and right in Spain just decided to shake hands with him and say, let's forget about what happened. Let's forget about the hundreds of thousands of victims and let's bury him with the victims. And his, his body was just exhumed, actually, on the day that the book Blood Song was out in France, by the way. So that was quite something. So for me, I, I, that book was really important because I wanted to talk again about women and the destiny of women in war. And because there were a very, there always are a very important part of everything because we used to be in the shadow of, of many of, of um, how do you say, big revolutions because that's where we were. But in Spain, there were lots of jails for women. And uh, those jails uh, for women um, ended up, well, well, all those women were jailed. They ended up, most of them being, uh, giving birth to children who were, brought up to um, be in orphanages where there was almost in all of them abuse abuse by priests and, and nuns and 
So it was, it was two generations who were suffering from that, from, from that uh, uh, dictatorship and who continued to, up to the 90s, to suffer from it because then babies were still, um, um, babies who were, um, how do you say, um, taken away from Republicans. You know, at that time, there were children of my age who were still looking for their parents. So it has been something that, again, people who didn't have a voice, didn't have a voice. There is a, bu a book that is beautiful, that is written by Dulce Chacon, which is about, which is called uh, Sleeping Voice. And, and this sleeping, sleeping Voices, and, and it's about that. I, I love to, 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 to give a voice to people who have been forgotten. For me, it's just... I don't know, it's on, on to my, I mean, at my little level, I mean, I'm, I'm not a historian or, but I love to give them, yes, a space to, to, to tell their story. And that's why in, in Blood Song, that's the, the part of Spain. And to see the impact of what a dictatorship can do. So Simone was talking about institution, what institution can do to people. That's exactly it what a war, what a dictatorship, the, the impact it can have. And you're going to have people who's going to be resilient and you're going to have people who's going to tur turn into a psychopath because they cannot deal with it. So that's where is Blob Song is not really about serial killers. It's more about, it's more about the impact of traumas and resilience or not. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Mm. Thank you. Thank you both. I, I am aware of time. But if you'll allow me two quick questions sent in um, by people um, earlier. Um, one is from Helene Keast, uh, an emerging crime writer up in, in Scotland. Uh, she's from the Netherlands. And she wanted to ask you both, what's the crime scene like uh, in France and in Germany? Uh, and is it as friendly as the crime fiction scene in the UK is? Um, in France, it's extremely friendly. It's, it's loads of fun. People who are very simple, who come from all different backgrounds, and that's why it's so interesting, because you can have, I don't know, a butcher <laughs> and another woodcarver and a teacher and a doctor and whatever they are and with different tastes you know some people who listen to rock and other one and it's just it's so much fun and people i mean we writing entertainment they know that and then when we meet is is really lots of fun it's friendly people help each other of course you have some people who have big egos but they're very famous um crime writers in france who still continue to promote their the example or help um, new writers. So in France, is, it's, it's like what I've experienced here in the UK. It's, it's wonderful. It's really a great scene to, to be working on and, and with, I mean, people to, to spend time with because that's what we do in festival. So, yeah. Great. And, and in Germany, Simona? Same really same people coming from various different backgrounds um, a lot of former journalists or screenwriters so um, you they they know how to to work in a team which you which you realize and notice when you meet each other so there's a lot of normally there's a lot of meeting up and drinking and all that unfortunately now <laughs> Oh. <laughs> but um yeah that's what i miss yeah meeting yeah. all these all these colleagues um not yeah. only in germany but all over europe yeah. of course that's one of the really bad things at the moment for me personally and, it, and it's beautiful you know to hear that there seems to be just that spirit of crime fiction you know of people getting together and um, people at different points in their careers helping other people and 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 I think you've probably been my my two favorite authors to to interview with regard to making it so easy because you mentioned team uh, and my last question uh, comes from Susan 
<laughs> it comes from uh, Susie Aspley, um, again, an emerging author uh, here in, in, in the UK, based up in Scotland. <clears throat> and she says, what is it like being an Arenda author uh, and being part of, of that crew, that team? It's so very special. <laughs> But there are, of course, a lot of secrets too, um, which we can't tell. Of course. Um, no, because it's wonderful. Because they have to kill us, no. <laughs> uh, no, I think Karen will kill us. <laughs> exactly. No, um, it's, um, it's just, it's so fantastic to have a passionate person or passionate, she's more than a publisher. She's, um, um, she's caring, she's... Um, Oh my God, she's running on four batteries normally, which is great. So um, you text her with something totally inappropriate, like during the tour, uh, Karen, where's my charger? Text her at night and she, chuk, 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 chuk. you had it two hours ago there and there. So go. She's like, it's, it's perfect. She's, um, she's passionate. She, she picks these totally different people mostly without knowing them, the translated authors. You know, she didn't know me before she picked me. I think it's with the Scandinavians the same. Um, but you meet, you, you come into this, into this group and you meet the others and you think like, wow, who did this? Who did this? And I, um, I appreciate every, every writer in this team um, as a writer and as a person, as a human being, it's just, um, it's lovely, it's wonderful. And you know, in Germany, I'm with a really big publishing company with, with a lot of history and weight and um, being part of such an indie publishing machine in the UK is a wonderful experience. And um, I'm really, really thankful for this and really happy. Beautiful. Johanna, is it the same experience for you? Oh yeah, for, for me, on top of that, it's, it, that already for me writing is, is, of course it's a job because I have contracts and I have to do it, but it's a passion. So I love doing this. And when I go and see my, 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 my friend, because most of them became friends, you know, in this Orenda group, it's, it's just a way to, to, to I don't know, to, to rest my mind and to have fun and and as Simone was saying we all so different because I think we couldn't be more different but yet as a group it's just perfect it works wonderfully there is a lot of respect I think there are no big egos there and there is um there is a lot of I think we're simple we like to have fun the same way I think we like to promote each other as well uh, and I think I'm amazed, as Simone was saying, I'm amazed about the fact that Karen could pull, pull that off because she just had an idea about the personality. And then she mixed that like a big fruit salad and it just turned out to be like the most amazing thing. And you're like, hang on. I mean, to be able to, to be such a good judge of characters, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's quite something because to be, to spend one week on the road with like 15, 17 authors and not have a single, it's not even argument, it's just that everything is, is flowing. It <laughs> so must I be terrible for Karen. Exactly it must be terrible for Karen. Her. For us, it's <laughs> big fun. It's like, her, oh, we're on holiday. Exhausted. For Karen, it must be like, oh my God. Exactly. Her, yeah. I think she's exhausted. I mean, yeah. she's the only person I can, I, in my life that I can, no, please take my ticket. I don't want to take care of my ticket. I'm so <laughs> you know, I wouldn't do it with anyone else. <laughs> You know, it's just like, it's exactly that thing of the charger. Oh, did, did that, yeah. that. Where's my charger? I'm hungry. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I have to go to the toilet. It's like, really, like, it's, it must be totally <laughs> horrible. Imagine you're having 14 children oh, no, at God. our age, you know, oh, but God. behaving yeah. like children. I can't, oh my God, it's terrible. No, I couldn't. I already have three. I don't want any more, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So yes, indeed. I mean, I, it's a it's a wonderful thing. It's lots of fun, to be mm. honest. It's lots of fun. It's lots wonderful. Of fun. I, I, as a reader, um, am so grateful for 
all those authors in translation, um, as you say, there's a certain something about their craft, but also in, in the people that they are. I think it's uh, within a wonderful world of crime fiction. That, to me, is, is, a, is a gem. Um, good women, I am so sorry that we're actually going to have to draw our conversation to the to a close i feel there's so much more that i want to talk about with you um and and i really hope that you will come back to to newcastle next year when you know the, the plan is to do this in real life um and yeah um <laughs> please um I thank you for closing off uh, our Newcastle Noir 2020 online festival. It has been so good to spend this hour together. Um, I actually quite forgot at one point that we weren't in the same room <laughs> to just, you know, the discussion of things. So I wish you all the very best um, with the writing uh, and your projects. Um, stay safe uh, and when fate allows it, I look forward to, to seeing you somewhere uh, beyond the Zoom room, yeah? So thank you, and good night to you both, yeah? Thank you, thank you, Jackie, for the having pleasure. Us. Thank you. See you soon. And so, once again, our weekend together comes to a close. If over this last weekend in May 2020, you have been with us, um, thank you so much. If you come later to these recordings and enjoy listening uh, to this selection of fine crime writers, again, thank you for being there. Thank you for your support. Thank you to all the subscribers uh, who've been joining us over the last month. Um, it's wonderful to see you there. I again would like to thank the authors uh, from this set and also from the first set of videos. Thank you for giving up your time uh, and for letting us um, capture you on camera uh, for all the world to see. Uh, and, and behind that, I have to say a massive thank you um, to Ross Fawcett, uh, our, our technical whiz who has held all these videos together, done the captioning and everything. So appreciate you being there with that. Um, next, I would like to thank Francis Walker. Um, the, the light bulb uh, behind most of what we do at, at Newcastle Noir. Um, and she and I uh, will be devising more things uh, for over, over the, the next 12 months uh, to bring you all hopefully safe and sound uh, to Newcastle for Newcastle Noir. Uh, at Newcastle City Library. And again, I'd like to thank the, the support of, of Derek Tree and David Hepworth and all the team at Newcastle City Library. Um, to the, the moderators who have been in this second half as well, uh, thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, Vic Watson, uh, Louise Fairburn, Craig Sisterson, um, it really makes such a, a wonderful difference um, to have have you there. Um, you know, just that support group uh, putting out the book love. That's brilliant. Uh, and a special thanks to Emma Watson, who did the BSL signing uh, for the Me Too panel. So, without further ado, um, this is it from Newcastle Noir 2020. Uh, do keep an eye out though on the on the YouTube channel because every now and again um, Dr. Noir will be here interviewing um, unsuspecting crime writers uh, throughout the next 12 months until we meet again. So goodbye for now everybody. Keep reading that crime fiction and see you soon. Bye.